um, really an outstanding researcher and clinician um, and spearheaded in, in many ways the uh, stem cell field in both discovery mode and also bringing it into the clinic. So it's my pleasure to have Dr. Marigakis present next. Association for the uh, for the invitation to come back and speak with all of you. I realized I was here in October, uh, and I'm happy also to say that the presentation, although the, the topic is very much the same, some of the presentation has changed a little bit, uh, which I think is good news. Uh, in, in, a, in a relatively short time, where we've made some um, some new discoveries and, and some new um, some new programs and, uh, and some new um, announcements that I think we can make today. Sure, why that slide was a little bit funny, but hopefully, the rest of the ball. We can see it here. Can you see that? It's yeah. John Thomas right here. <laughs> so, Lucy showed this slide. I, I do think it is um, instructive if for only one thing, and that is when we've made enormous strides in discovering genes for ALS. My uh, suspicion is the vast majority of you uh, fit into this large blue piece of the pie, which is which is sporadic disease. And so while a lot of the drugs that we're currently investigating and a lot of the strategies we're currently investigating are, are targeted towards things we know about with ALS, the next question is, is there something that we can, or what can we do for our patients also with sporadic disease as well? And I think James will also highlight a, a number of those um, uh, programs with regard to clinical trials that include not only patients with familial ALS, but also certainly sporadic disease as well. Lucy also showed you a, a somewhat more complicated slide. Fundamental to my discussion today is, and really as we think about drug development, stem cell strategies, um, gene therapy strategies, is really the recognition that ALS really is not just a motor neuron disease, but in fact other cell types, including um, astrocytes, which are these supporting cells uh, here, oligodendrocytes, which are uh, essentially uh, cells that uh, insulate uh, nerves, as well as a variety of other cells in the brain actually participate in some cases causing disease, but encouragingly also allow us to have new targets for either drug therapies or in the case of what I'm gonna show you today, some, some different stem cell strategies. So it's not just about motor neurons, but about these other cell types as well. So that's an exciting um, uh, observation from the field. So how about some observations from the, from the clinic? Um, as a general rule, why does weakness in ALS seem to have, and I don't know the answers to most of these, but I'm going to show you today how we're going to attempt to answer some of these questions. So as a general, why, why does weakness in ALS seem to have a distinct anatomical spread? If a patient's foot is weak, his or her leg might get weak long before he or she develops trouble chewing and swallowing. Why does ALS progress slowly in some cases, years or decades, and others progress more rapidly in the case of months? Why do some patients present with we call upper motor neuron findings, stiffness and spasticity, whereas other patients may have what we call lower motor neuron disease, muscle weakness, muscle atrophy. Why do some patients have bulbar ALS with trouble chewing and swallowing, and some have things like foot drop, what we call spinal onset ALS? Why are certain cell populations spared? So for example, the eye muscles are almost uniformly spared in our ALS patients. And largely, things like bowel and bladder, what we call the autonomic nervous system, is largely spared in ALS. What, what can we learn about those specific cell types? At the end of the day, ALS is really no longer thought of as a neuromuscular disease or a motor neuron disease, only but more appropriately as a neurodegenerative disease. Neurodegenerative disease. I think that's important because, I think as Lucy pointed out, what we might learn about diseases like, let's say, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, those very same um, and understanding those disease mechanisms or potential treatments for one of those diseases may have a very nice crossover into other diseases like ALS. So it, it turns out that we do have a, a mouse model of ALS that's been around for, for some time. And it's, um, uh, it's certainly not a perfect model by any means, but it still does remain very much a gold standard for the way we think about screening drugs and understanding disease mechanisms. And this animal this uh, mouse develops weakness of the arms and the legs, and it's really used to help uh, understand disease and screen drugs. But is it good enough? And furthermore, how much does that really tell us about our patients as individuals? 
Well, the question then is, are there opportunities to use human, what we call IPS cells, which are called the induced pluripotent potent stem cells, to address the heterogeneity of ALS? So everyone in this room is a little bit different. So if we were to develop 100 IPS cells from 100 different patients, they would look all very different, or they could look all very different. And so if we ask the questions that I posed to you at the beginning, when we see our patients in the clinic, if we have a patient with bulbar ALS, we make an IPS cell line. If we have a patient with foot drop, we make an IPS cell line, or a fast progressor, or a slow progressor, then we can really start to get to some of these questions. We can only really do that in patients because really all the mice that I just showed you in the previous slide look identical. So a number of years ago, really now 2007 and 2008, was the creation of uh, what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. And these are, um, can be taken from adults, so we no longer have to worry as much about things like embryonic stem cell types or fetal stem cell types, so there's clearly still a place for that. We can now take cells from um, people, and when I used to give this lecture, I used to say we take skin from patients, which we still do. But in a new program and new technologies have allowed us to really take blood from patients as well. We can now take these blood cells or skin cells and apply some very um, uh, specific genes that can turn these cells from skin cells or blood cells now into IPS cells. And these cells now can become any cell type of the, of the body. So not even just brain cells that we're very focused on, but liver and heart and kidney and so forth. And this really, we hope, it will allow us three different things. Patient-specific cell therapy. What makes each of us unique may dictate how, uh, our, uh, how we may approach that. Drug screening. What drug might be good for one person may not be the same drug that might be good for the next person. We've certainly learned that from the cancer literature. And finally, human disease modeling. We can use these cells, we think, to learn something about ALS itself, and I'll show you some examples of that. Um, so at Hopkins, um, we have taken, um, uh, we've created well over 50 lines of induced pluripotent stem cells. This goes back to work that we really started about uh, five or six years ago now. And I show you this, uh, not so much for the detail, but to tell you that we could, we've taken skin from about 150 patients. We've taken skin from patients with the SOD1 mutation, with the C9 ORF mutation, TDP43, so a lot of patients with familial ALS. But also we've made stem cells from patients with slowly progressing disease, or typical progression, or fast progression. We've taken stem cells from patients with primary lateral sclerosis, and so forth. So this starts to get to the idea that we could have individualized, if you will, medicine, or at least start to group patients together, try to understand what makes certain groups of patients uh, unique. Realizing that when we have 53 cell lines, and I'm going to tell you about a new strategy to make over 1,000 cell lines, um, that, that's a lifetime, lifetime's worth of work. And so we've been very much interested in getting our stem cells out to, uh, to investigators really all over the country. This is uh, Baltimore here. Um, all over the country, really all over the world, attempt to, to share this um, unique resource. And there are efforts not only at Hopkins, but in a variety of other institutions as well to share uh, what, we've, what we've learned and, and share these resources. So there's what we call phenotypic heterogeneity. If we all look different, or if ALS looks so different uh, amongst patients, are all the mechanisms of nerve degeneration the same, or could we get some clues from these cell types? So this is it, it's a general strategy. We're interested in taking human-induced polyfunk stem cells from ALS patients and differentiating, that is, making them into other cell types. And so we can make them into motor neurons, or the oligodendrocytes, I told you, that insulate the cell, or the astrocytes that support the cells. And this is somewhat of a complicated <coughs> slide, but what I want to show you is there's some patients here in green, and those are normal patients. There are some patients here in pink, which might have sporadic ALS, and some patients here in red who might have familial ALS. And so we can actually separate those patients out, make stem cells from each of those um, patients, and then, once we have those stem cells, we can make them into motor neurons or astrocytes or other cell types. And so, hopefully what you can see is there's an enormous um, branching of this tree, and so we hopefully can get a lot of information from these groups of patients. So what can we learn from these? We think we can learn a lot of things about ALS-specific pathology. So we know that there are very specific pathologies, when I say pathologies, cells look different, brains look different in different patients and we recapitulate that in a dish. We can actually measure the electrical activity of cells. 
And so we can do that in a variety of different patients. You can look at cell stress. So people ask about cell stress or exposures to environmental toxins as a possible cause. And we can now do that, we believe, in a dish. And then we can also look by mixing these cells up and putting them all in the same dish. We can actually ask questions about how one cell type might influence another cell type. And finally, we can actually believe we can actually get to the point where we'll be able to screen drugs. So we might be able to do what we might call a clinical trial in a dish. So these might represent uh, what, uh, 24 different patients in 24, um, this is a little um, petri dish, so 24 different patients who might all look different. We can look at how a drug might affect each of those patients individually. That's where we want to be. So we start to take the first steps to do that. I mean, work by um, uh, our, our group here at Hopkins, as well as others, have demonstrated that at least from these patients with this C9 ORF uh, uh, mutation, we were able to um, take fibroblasts, the skin cells from these patients, make iPS cell lines. We've also done that from other patients as well. And we're actually able to correlate this in some cases with patient brain and spinal cord samples as well. And what we found that was much like in patient tissue, these stem cells, and this is just a big nucleus of a, of a stem cell. And a lot of these green dots, which represent abnormal inclusions, or these green dots shouldn't be there. So what we found in these stem cells in a dish, very much like a brain, cells from a brain sample of a patient. So these green dots should not be there in the brain uh, sections, and, and they are, and they should not be there in the stem cells from these patients, and in fact, they are. We also use the same technique to actually stress these cells out. So we made them, we uh, applied a stressor and actually tried to ask our patients who carry this C9 or 72 mutation, to make stem cells from those patients, are they more vulnerable to cell stress? And the answer is yes. And then finally, a slide I took out because I only have an hour and a half to talk to you. <laughs> 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 We can actually screen drugs against this and ask, can we modify the way these cells survive? Can we improve their survival? Can we do a clinical trial in the dish? We believe the answer to that is yes, so much so that this particular technique called antisense technology uh, against this specific mutation is now proceeding, hopefully, the clinical trial um, sooner rather than later. And the second uh, example, just to show you, and I think James, I think, will touch on this, but. Um, group at Harvard, including uh, Kevin Egan, they were actually to take stem cells from patients with SOD1 mutations and found out when they put these cells in a dish, these cells were in fact very excitable. They were too, they were too easily stimulated. They did a large drug screen and found a single or a handful of drugs that were affected, and one of those was a drug called ritigamine. And so if you don't know about it already, I suspect James will touch, uh, touch, touch on that clinical trial. So the idea is now we'll have our first my knowledge, clinical trial where we discovered a drug in stem cells and we'll be actually applying that to patients. And a new effort called the Individualized ALS Treatment Initiative, or IATI, this is a really a collaboration with a number of different um, organizations, including the ALS Association. The idea is, I told you we can, we're looking towards individualized medicine. We're actually going to do a comprehensive and longitudinal study of over a thousand patients. We're not going to take skin from a thousand patients, we'd rather do this um, from blood. And we're actually going to follow patients along for at least over a, at least a year period where we'll analyze patients and see how they're doing and see how they're um, responding. And we'll also make stem cells from all of those patients and do the same kinds of things that I just discussed. Drug screening, understanding how the genetics are different. I'm sending these cells to the New York Genome Center to do um, uh, in-depth uh, genetic analyses try to learn about patients and what makes patients different, but also at the same time, also at the same time with an attempt to try to understand what drugs might be effective. So I'll, I'll, I'll skip over this because we all know who we, we know who we are, but most importantly, these cells will all be um, publicly available. So I just as I showed you that the Hopkins group had sent these cells kind of worldwide, this will be a very similar effort because having a thousand patient cell lines is a lifetime's worth of, of work to do. So we're happy to to share this. There are some challenges to iPS cell therapy. And one of the, some of those questions are how close do these um, cells in the dish, these iPS cells, really recapitulate what happens in patients, right? We have skin and we have heart and organs and so forth. So how well does this, what happens in a dish, 
how predictive is it? How well do these IPS cells recapitulate disease mechanisms? To identify ALS gene mutations like SOD1 and C9 ORF represent the disease as a whole, I should be 90% of patients have sporadic disease. Is there a uniform strategy for making these cells? It's one thing to make one person's cell line. How about a thousand patients? Can we reproduce these data in Baltimore and Philadelphia and Los Angeles and Boston? How well can we do that? Um, how many patients do we need to sample before we can make something um, a, a confident statement? Um, and how can we scale this up? So we're, we're, we're thinking about all of these different strategies. So that's part one. IPS cells for drug discovery, understanding disease mechanisms, and potentially for cell therapy. Um, part two, if I'm, if I'm, doing, if I'm doing okay, is, is really a, a, an update from the strategy. And this strategy is not just work that, not just an approach that I'm doing in my lab, it actually is uh, by at least a couple of other groups uh, here, in the, uh, here in the states. So we've been interested in thinking about how can stem cells be used to help patients with ALS? And I think these are some of the questions that we've really started to ask ourselves now. Uh, believe it or not, 15 years ago, our initial idea was to actually regrow motor neurons. And I think that's still the, the holy grail, is to take a motor neuron, transplant that cell, and have it regrow out to muscle. But importantly, I think we realized very early on that because those other cell types that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture, like astrocytes or oligodendrocytes, play a role in ALS, what happens if we just replace those cells instead of trying to regrow motor neurons. So it actually may be easier to afford what we call a neuroprotective effect to patients' own motor neurons by instead of replacing those dead neurons. So can we use them essentially as a drug to protect uh, motor neurons? So my lab has been very interested in this cell called the glial restricted precursor. This is almost like designer cell therapy. This isn't just a random stem cell. This is a stem cell that is taken from fetal tissue and can either become only an astrocyte or an oligodendrocyte. It can't become a neuron. But we're very good at understanding and designing these cells to become these supporting cell types. So we, a number of years ago, then studied this, uh, this ALS rat, so very similar to the mouse. And we transplanted these cells right into the spinal cord uh, of these animals, right where the motor neurons live. The idea was, could these cells cuddle up around people's own motor neurons, in this case, an animal model. And we thought if we were to think about how we might want to treat a patient, we thought about this very early on. The idea in my lab, because I see ALS patients, was I didn't want this to be just curing mice and curing rats, but how would we think about going to patients? So if you wanted the biggest bang for your buck and you knew that you had to put cells into the spinal cord of a patient, where would you want to go? And really where you want to go is in, in the cervical spinal cord because patients run into trouble with regard to their breathing function. It turns out here in the neck are the nerve cells that control the diaphragm. So we targeted the cells and, and it turns out that these animals have the same diaphragm breathing problems. So we put these cells right into the neck uh, of these animals, right into the spinal cord at these levels called C4, C5, and C6. The details here um, aren't necessarily important as to how many cells we put in. When we did this with rodent cells, what, what we found, in fact, was that these cells really migrated up and down the spinal cord. This is a, a, a section of the spinal cord. All these cells in black are our cells, or the cells here in green is this section. And in fact, just as we might have predicted, about 90% of these cells, um, because these were designer stem cells, became the cells of interest, that is, astrocytes. So we were using astrocytes to support motor neurons. So they very effectively became these astrocytes. So much like a drug, if you take an aspirin, we know exactly what the chemical compound is. If we take these stem cells and put them into an animal, we know exactly what these cells can become. They cuddled up around motor neurons. And importantly, they actually um, helped maintain breathing function in these animals. And also importantly, they also helped to improve or maintain the, the um, arm function in these animals as well. And it went to great lengths to show why that might occur. So what we really were insistent on, and that's why this project, quite frankly, has taken a number of years, we really didn't want this to be, um, uh, we wanted to have a really strong rationale and a really strong scientific reason why we should go forward with this project, not just that we could get some stem cells and put them in somewhere and have some kind of magic happen. We thought really about 
scientifically why this might occur. And I won't, um, I, I won't go into that in great detail, but uh, we're actually able to show why this uh, very well might be the case. So the next question is, can what we learn with this animal model be translated to the ALS clinic? So we subsequently did these same studies now using human um, glial-restricted precursors. And these again are derived from the fetal tissue. We were able to put them back into the spinal cord and show that they, in fact, became the cells of interest. And we didn't see the, the robust um, uh, benefit in, these, in this particular animal model. We think that's primarily because human cells grow a lot more slowly than animal cells. So we used the same animal model, but these cells just didn't get, have a chance to do the right thing, if you will. Nevertheless, um, some longer-term studies are ongoing now in longer-lived uh, uh, hosts. Nevertheless, the FDA was actually very excited, I think, about uh, this uh, approach. And so we approached the Food and Drug Administration uh, a number of years ago now. And these are really the key issues that have to be addressed before these cells can be transplanted into patients. So this is what the Food and Drug Administration keeps them up at night. Do these human cells have similar properties to rodent cells? So I showed you some very nice findings of rodent cells. Do the human cells look the same? Giving aspirin uh, is the cell you're to, is the thing you're going to give to the rat. Is aspirin going to be the same thing you're giving to the human? So the answer to this is, is yes, very similar properties. Do these cells form tumors? So the answer is no. And what we don't want is to put a, essentially a cell that's going to make a, a brain tumor. Does the transplantation of these cells into the spinal cord that I just showed you, because we saw what we call ectopic engraftment. So we had to make sure that if we put the cells in the spinal cord, they didn't didn't end up in the liver. You don't want a brain cell in the liver or the heart. And finally, is the surgical transplantation of these, strat of, of these cells safe? So um, what we did was actually take these cells, and I'm, I'm not going to give you the, essentially the, the bottom line. What we did is take these cells and put them into a whole bunch of rats, like 40 or 60 um, rats. And this is what I can tell you, that in fact these cells did not form tumors, so that's really important to the, to the FDA. And we left these animals out for a very long time, just like we might do in humans, to make sure they didn't form tumors. They, in fact, stayed in the spinal cord where we put them. Excitingly, these actually cells migrated up and down the spinal cord. And in some cases, when we put them into the neck part of the spinal cord, they went all the way into the brain and all the way down into the lower back. And most importantly, they, they survived, and they didn't cause these normal rats any harm. So, it seems that they were safe, they stayed where they uh, were supposed to go, and they didn't form tumors. So then, the other thing I want to emphasize is ALS is, a, I think, a very collaborative community, and I think Lucy just showed you that um, very much, that it's a partnership with pharmaceutical companies, but I think just as importantly, academic groups as well. So we partnered with a group at, at Emory University that's been part of the neural STEM trial, and they have um, their neurosurgeon, Nick Boulis and, and John Glass, who are down there. We're essentially using the same strategy. So think of it as a different drug, but taking it the same way. So you might get oral aspirin, you might get IV aspirin, you might get aspirin in a variety of different ways. And we try to make the delivery system the same, but it's a different, it's a different drug. So the FDA said, well, you know, rats are small. How about, how do you know this will be safe in a human when you put this into a human spinal cord? So it turns out these are called mini pigs. They weigh about 40 pounds. Um, and their spinal cord is about the same size as human spinal cords. And we actually injected these cells. This is a pig under here. And this is the device that goes right into the spinal cord. We delivered these cells, which are called Q cells. The company is called Q Therapeutics. And I should point out um, that I'm uh, um, I'll be the principal investigator of the study. I'm not paid by Q Therapeutics. I want to make that clear. It's important. Um, so I'm not paid by Q Therapeutics. So we put these cells right into the pig, and we let them um, hang around for about a month. And importantly, these animals all did fine. They weren't paralyzed. The cells were still there. The cells survived. There, was, there were no tumors. Um, and so that's actually very encouraging to suggest we can use that same strategy in patients. So, uh, so much so that we've designed in collaboration with this company to do um, 12, a 12 patient study really at the, um, uh, at the uh, direction of the, of the FDA. And the first uh, patients will get um, cells injected five different times in the one side of the lower part of the spinal cord. 
The next one will get cells on both sides. The next patient will get it on one side of the neck. And the final group will get it on both sides uh, of the neck. And we'll do it several different doses of these, uh, these stem cells. So this is really one strategy that my lab has really tried to pioneer through for a number of years. There are other stem cell trials. I don't have time to highlight all of them, but certainly our colleagues um, at neural stem. Um, I think it's important to tell you, and I think it's important for you to understand that not all stem cells are the same, so these are all different drugs, if you will, um, uh, with some differences. So these are, so these are neural stem um, uh, cells. There's also a trial where uh, another group is trying to put what we call mesenchymal stem cells into the spinal fluid, and then another group is trying to do a genetic um, uh, modification of these cells uh, into, into spinal fluid. And then I have other colleagues in Los Angeles who don't have a clinical trial yet that actually have another cell type to transplant. So this doesn't happen um, in a vacuum. This involves collaborators. Uh, this is work at, at Hopkins and this has a company partnership um, as well as collaborators nationally and internationally. I am happy to say that um, uh, three weeks ago, three weeks ago now, the Food and Drug Administration actually approved what we call an IND, approved uh, this uh, stem cell therapy to go forward into patients. So my hope is that we'll, um, after a number of years of getting to this point, that we'll be able to bring this um, to patients with ALS. So I'll stop there. Thanks. transplant stem cells, could there be a number of different pathways that are influenced? That's actually an insightful comment, because it turns out that the FDA views it that way as well. It's very hard to, um, I'll go back to the aspirin analogy. Aspirin is the same when they give it to a, it's the same chemical structure when they give it to a rat or a human. A human stem cell is going to act differently if you give it to a rat and you give it to a human. So the first thing is we don't know how those cells will react in an animal versus a patient. Part two is a cell does a lot, a lot of different things, thousands of different things. And so it's impossible, quite honestly, to understand um, there may be a lot of things that those cells can do. And so we went through some very good studies that astrocytes um, do a lot of different things. And if you put in good astrocytes, if you will, if you, were, if you make good astrocytes in these ALS mouse models, in fact, they can be very, very, very protective. So, Yes, we may not have, there may not be one way they work, but maybe 10 ways, or maybe 50 ways uh, that those cells might work. Right. Yes, this is such an open enrollment, like John Hopkins, or will this also be happening here, say, in Philadelphia Administration Hospital? So, um, the idea behind the first, uh, the first pass of the trial will be at two sites, right? It'll be at, um, the, the plan is to be at Hopkins and Emory University. Um, and the hope is that we can um, you know, bring it everywhere, certainly, but that's just by virtue of the numbers of patients we can do uh, straight away. So is it, is it an open involvement now, or is it still critical? So when you school, any patient with ALS will be a potential, any patient with ALS could be a potential candidate, just as if what, someone ran into a drug trial. And what I will say is, I think it's, it's an important point, um, the community is a very close community in general. So, for example, with a drug trial, if I'm running a drug trial and um, uh, and Lauren's running a drug trial, I might say, you know, I don't have any more slots for my drug trial. You should go to Philadelphia and see Lauren, or you should go to Boston and see James. So, there's a lot of crosstalk amongst amongst those sites, and so that makes me feel good, and I think we've certainly done that for our patients. Not just about stem cells, but really any drug or any uh, other therapy, quite honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have two Thanks. unrelated questions. One is that the delivery here is through uh, the spinal cord or the brain as well. They did some studies uh, delivering it muscularly. The muscles were picked up in the nerves. Is there any evidence of ALS that's primarily a disease or is it more of a... Right. The 
first question is, um, what about other places to, what about other places to target? Is muscle important? Or should we be targeting muscle? So even independent of, let's say, forgetting stem cells, I think absolutely. So I think, just like we think about cancer chemotherapy, where you might try four, might have four different compounds or four different drugs in a cocktail that might be helpful. I, I think we envision that in many ways, is you might have beyond Milyazol, and then, let's say, stem cells, and then injections of um, uh, viruses in the muscle to help support all those. So I, I don't see, I certainly hope one is a cure, but it might be a, a combination strategy. Number two, is there any evidence to suggest that it's only astrocytes? Um, probably not specifically. It's going to be a subset of, uh, of ALS that is just an astrocyte or an oligodendrocyte disease. Um, maybe uh, the astrocyte. Uh, we could potentially learn that, but it's not. A, from what we know about astrocytes, it's not an obvious initiator of disease, but maybe, or more likely, quite frankly, that it um, speeds the disease along. Thank you.